Hello and welcome back to Educator.com and welcome back to Biochemistry. So in our last lesson, we talked about myoglobin. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to start talking about hemoglobin. So let's just jump right on in. Okay. Now, um, whereas myoglobin is involved in the diffusion of the, um, of the oxygen in muscle tissue, so whereas myoglobin is involved in the diffusion of O2 in muscle tissue, well, tissue hemoglobin That's the protein which actually transports the oxygen in the blood. Is the protein, <clears throat> excuse me, which transports the O2 in the blood. Now, hemoglobin has four subunits. So, hemoglobin, which is uh, abbreviated HB, it has four subunits. So it's not like myoglobin. Myoglobin was just a single subunit protein uh, that has a binding site for uh, one molecule of oxygen. It has four subunits, and each of these subunits has a heme group with a heme group. So we have, <clears throat> excuse me, four sites to bind O2. per protein molecule. Now, the interactions of the subunits, the interactions of the subunits, they cause conformational changes that affect hemoglobin's affinity for O2. Okay, so the conformational changes among these subunits, as one O2 binds, there's going to be a conformational change, and that conformational change is going to affect uh, the extent to which another O2 will bind or release depending on the physiological conditions at hand. So you remember, um, <clears throat> we need to actually bind the O2 tightly. We need to take it to another part of the body, to the tissues, and we need to be able to release it. So we need that, that flexibility, that great degree of flexibility, in fact, because um, the oxygen that's coming, uh, you know, the lungs is going to be a particular concentration of oxygen, but that's not the same concentration of oxygen that's in the tissues. So we don't want some molecule that just binds O2 and hangs onto it. It needs to be able to deliver it. And we don't need it to, we need, well, if, or if we have a molecule that is, you know, that, that doesn't bind it very well, well, if it doesn't bind it very well, then it's not going to take up the oxygen um, that's in the lungs. So we need that high degree of flexibility based on different concentrations of O2. And again, since it's a gas, we're going to be talking about different partial pressures of O2. Okay, so now um, hemoglobin has alpha and beta subunits. So it has two alpha subunits and it has two beta subunits. Uh, alpha and beta subunits, two of each. So we have an alpha one, beta one, and an alpha two, beta two. So the alpha one, beta one are, um, they interact rather tightly, and the alpha two, beta two, they interact tightly. Now, there is interaction between the alpha-1, beta-2 and the alpha-2, beta-1, but it's a weaker interaction. So the alpha 
it has 141 amino acid residues and the beta has 146 amino acid residues. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at an image of hemoglobin here. So we have our alpha 1, beta 1, we have our um, alpha 2, and our beta 2. So here you can see you have your alpha 1, beta 1, that interaction, that forms so that's one subunit, two, this is the third, this is the fourth. Now you can also make out in each subunit it has its own heme group. So here is the heme group for this one. And this one is a little hidden. You can see the heme group right here. Let me go ahead and so it's right, right there. And you have the heme group right there for that one. And it's right there for this one. And here it is for that. Now, I don't know if you can actually see the oxygens. It doesn't look like oxygen is bound, or maybe it is. It's hard to tell. Um, but that's it. This is what it looks like. So alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 2, beta 2. That's it. Nice and straightforward multi-subunit protein. You have this gap in between, which is going to become very, very important in just a little bit. OK, <clears throat> so now our alpha 1, beta 1, and alpha 2, beta 2, K, their respective interactions are quite strong. Strong. You have about 30 amino acids between alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 2, and beta 2 that are interacting with each other. So 30 amino acids interacting, um, that's pretty strong interaction. Now as far as the alpha 1, beta 2, and the alpha 2, beta 1 down here, alpha 1, alpha 1, beta 2, alpha 2, beta 1, the interactions in this region and that region there, they are less strong. I'll put the interactions are less strong, somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, 18 or 19 amino acid residues that actually end up interacting. Uh, when we use chemical agents to actually separate these subunits, as it turns out, um, they break up not into four separate subunits. Or we can do that if we want to. But uh, for mild treatment, what ends up happening is the alpha 1 and beta 1 actually stay together, and the alpha 2 and beta 2 stay together. So the interactions are quite strong between those subunits. All right. So hemoglobin, <clears throat> let's see. So hemoglobin, it has two major conformations. Two major conformations. One is called the T state, and T stands for tense. This is where no oxygen has bound to it. So this is deoxyhemoglobin. So this is deoxyhemoglobin. And then there's something called an R state. In this case, R stands for relaxed. And this is the oxyhemoglobin. So when oxygen is actually bound to it, the more oxygen that's bound to it, the hemoglobin is in more of an R state. So when we say it has two major conformations, we're not saying it goes from T to R, boom. There is a transition. You have four oxygen molecules that are binding to the hemoglobin. So as one of them binds, there is some conformational change, and it starts to move away from the tense state, and it starts to make the transition over to the R state. So now it makes the second molecule of oxygen a little easier to bind. That second oxygen causes more conformational changes, shifts it more towards the relaxed state, which makes it more easy to bind the third oxygen. By the time the fourth oxygen molecule binds, it's completely in the relaxed state. So the relaxed state, the R state, has a high affinity for oxygen. The T state has a low affinity for oxygen. Now, these terms high and low, these are relative terms. We're not saying that this 
T-state hemoglobin has no oxygen attached to it. That's not it at all. In fact, it's about 60% saturated with oxygen. The difference is the R-state is about 96% saturated with oxygen. So it isn't zero, 100. It isn't all or nothing. It's just it's relative, degrees of saturation. The R state, very, very saturated with oxygen. That's the arterial blood. That's the red blood that has um, all that wonderful oxygen in it. Um, the T state, about 60% saturation for the hemoglobin, that tends to be more of a bluish purple. That's the venous blood. That's the blood that's actually coming back from the tissues uh, because it's delivered its oxygen. Now it's depleted oxygen. So the color actually changes. Okay, now the binding of O2, okay, so as we just said, the binding of O2 to a subunit of T state hemoglobin causes a conformational change toward the R state, toward the R state. And again, it is a transition. It isn't just boom, it goes to the R state. Toward the R state, which has a greater affinity for O2. So it begins to bind more O2. And the more O2 it binds, the more it wants to bind. That's this sort of domino effect, if you will, of this thing called cooperative binding, which we'll talk a little bit about um, a little bit later. Okay, so now 